be speaking on the topic of ancestors at a place like Penn where, uh, as Wendy mentioned last night, we do have so many um, important um, ancestors, ancestors um, in the sense of the intellectual, intellectual legacy of Maya archaeology, so even just coming into Rainy Auditorium evokes all sorts of, of memories and, uh, and uh, connections with the past. So um, what I'd like to do today is, is talk about Maya ancestors from a number of different perspectives, um, how uh, Maya people of the past um, perceived of their ancestors and sort of what they used them for and how they tried to connect with them. Um, and I also want to elaborate on a concept that David Stewart introduced in his Order of Days book, um, the notion of folded time and folded time epistemologies, that um, time actually can fold back on itself, and it is at these critical junctures um, in which it is a particularly auspicious time to celebrate the ancestors or to affect a concurrence uh, with ancestors. So I will, um, um, I will come back um, to that topic. Um, so, okay, so um, uh, Loa mentioned that, um, it, that the, I'm working on the second edition of Living with the Ancestors and it's, it's in production now. And so this is wonderful for me to have the opportunity to come here and speak with you today because I've just spent some time thinking about what's changed since 1995. That was the publication date um, for the first edition of Living with the Ancestors. And, you know, that was quite a while ago. That was, uh, uh, you know, in another Bakhtun. Um, and so what has happened since then? And I think that a lot has happened. And I remember when, um, when I was writing Living with the Ancestors, uh, there was still so much just kind of uh, discussion and skepticism about the, uh, the royal dynastic genealogies that were being hieroglyphically deciphered. Um, and that is all in our, um, in our recent history now. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's all behind us. And um, some of that, the, the work on that, of course, um, took place by individuals who are here with us today, like Simon Martin, who compiled that wonderful comparative sort of chronicle of the, uh, dy of the dynasties, of the major dynasties in the Maya, uh, from the classic Maya past. Um, I think we also, since, um, uh, since 95, have a much better understanding of the complexity of ancestralizing practices among, um, as the uh, Occupy Wall Street people said, the 99%, the other 99%. And I want to talk a little bit about that today, um, uh, how, we, how we are beginning to understand that and think about that in, in a way that's really fundamentally different than where we were in the early 90s when I was writing Living with the Ancestors. I think one thing that I'm struck by also is the way in which these two have uh, kind of cross-fertilized each other and that what we have learned uh, hieroglyphically and what we have learned through the excavation of royal interments has really informed our understanding and interpretation of burial contexts among the 99%. So there has been a real, uh, in this area in particular, a real fertile cross, um, a real cross fertilization. Um, another thing that we've come to understand much more is the, the importance of ancestral bodies. Uh, the, the actual, uh, you know, bodies, like bones and, and perhaps flesh, but mostly just bones, uh, to political sovereignty and social identity. Um, and this is uh, true for the past, and I think it's true today. And I will um, move through uh, this newer understanding into some of the cultural heritage work that, that we've been doing uh, more recently. And finally, um, I think that we've come to an understanding of the importance of recalling ancestors into the lives of the living uh, through these events that Steve Houston calls concurrence events. Um, and so, and this um, <clears throat> links to the, uh, this notion of folded time that I want to elaborate on a little bit today. So uh, we've been busy and um, our understanding of, of ancestors has really, I think, moved uh, and deepened significantly uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. 
Okay, so the complexity of ancestralizing practice is among the 99%. Mm. And here we um, uh, are reminded that one of the um, one of the real early breakthroughs as a result of Marshall Becker's uh, participation in the Tikal project was the recognition of the eastern shrines. Oops, eastern shrines that in these um, quadrilateral um, residential compounds that uh, there would often be in the Peipen in areas that um, and evoke that same architectural tradition. Uh, there would often be an eastern structure that was uh, a non-residential structure, a shrine structure, and a place of uh, ancestor interment. And, and this is a wonderful uh, map and reconstruction by Christopher Helmka. Uh, and in it, he notes the a location of looting pits at this site called Pook's Hill in Belize. Um, so you can see that the, the significance of the Eastern Shrine is not uh, lost on uh, looters today, and, and, and they know that there will be uh, interments in there uh, with very special uh, burial goods associated with them. Um, but then we also, of course, do know that um, interments could take place uh, in house floors, under house floors, uh, between construction units, um, and that the placement of burials um, within residence, very much um, an operative concept. Um, but it was a very uh, selective subset of individuals who were placed um, uh, under house floors. Um, and this is just a, a section wall uh, from Kashob, Operation 14. This is the west wall. And the red bars show you, uh, these are four, I think there were about eight um, interments of older adult males in axial alignment with the structure. And each one of them was related to a new construction event. And so this is what I've called social stratigraphy because you have this layering of uh, ancestor interment, construction event, ancestor interment, construction event. Um, and the tempo and timing of it certainly appears to, to my eyes anyway, to uh, be signaling um, this kind of basically change in the head of household role through time. Um, so this is yet another pattern. This is not the Eastern Shrine variant. This is actually happening in residences. Um, and so if we look across, and this is what I was describing, the structure, structure 54 up here, late classic uh, series of adult males uh, interred on axis within the dwelling, single burials, uh, extended position. Um, but then there's another structure down here, another late classic structure, in which we found not really not much in the way of stratigraphy of these uh, stratified floor lenses, but a series of, and a series of um, uh, more than one individual in a burial pit. Um, and often when we can, could recognize sex, older uh, female adults with children, with five to seven-year-old children, um, in what we now have come to understand as a burial mound. And we really don't use this term in the Maya region very often. We have uh, burials in, in, in dwellings. We have burials in shrines and pyramids. But this other category of just a burial mound is not really very commonly spoke of. But it seems to be what we have in this situation. And also the pairing of with of old adults and children is evocative of a concept called halok keshok, um, which is a Zutuhil notion of replacement, and that often relates grandparents and grandchildren together. Um, so, uh, so there may be some concept like that underlying this repetitive placement of, of older uh, adults with uh, children who certainly have uh, died before their time because of some kind of disease. Um, in the south, early classic, an actual stone line burial crypt. Um, and then under B Plaza here, just another whole entire community of middle and late pre-classic men, women, and children um, interred under earlier house floors that were subsequently buried by a plaza. <clears throat> So we can see, even in this uh, place we call Kashob, which is not a large site, 
by any stretch of the imagination, tremendous variation um, and complexity in burial patterns. So it wasn't a one-size-fits-all way of handling the dead and placing, but keeping the dead close to you, but in a lot of different um, kinds of, like a lot of different configurations. Okay, we, um, we speak quite a bit about the nourishment provided uh, for ancestors, for the dead, and certainly from the preclassic, the, um, the spouted vessel, um, I, probably the preclassic variant of the, of the cacao vessel. Uh, was well represented at Kashob. And we talk about, and, and, and with these very signature kind of burials, a duck pot with, uh, with an older male. Um, and so we think about nourishment for the individuals or perhaps uh, embarking on a journey um, uh, and at, to the afterlife, through an afterlife. Uh, to get to someplace else. It's kind of a fuzzy understanding of this. Some, um, it, 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 and there is something happens to the body and then something happens to the soul. So the body, in a very uh, clear materialist sense, is going to stay at this place, right? It's not going to be uh, transported, as in a Star Trek episode, to another place, you know. But the soul will move. Um, so exactly what the point of putting um, nourishment uh, was in these uh, in these burial contexts. Um, it, it's not we have kind of a hazy understanding of that at this point in time. Um, some and another just very striking example that I wanted to show you was from the um, uh, some more recent work that uh, we've been doing in the Sibun Valley of Belize. Um, these are the Maya Mountains of southern Belize, the Caribbean right here, and this is the course of the Sibun River, the blue squiggly line, and then the red circles are sites that we've mapped. And one mid-valley site called Pakalna, because it's in the middle of a citrus orchard, um, and this big tree here is a structure, of a, a big mound that was too large uh, to be placed in citrus, and here you see the profile of it here with uh, an axial trench that we are excavating into it. Um, and we, uh, the, we hit the southern end of uh, a very deep, very large burial pit. So this is terminal classic. Now this is at the sort of the other end of the classic period from the, those pre-classic spouted vessels that I just showed you from the middle and late pre-classic burials. Um, and what we see in this interment, and, and you can just to orient you, here are the, the, lay, the lower legs um, of the individual, the pelvic area, the vertebrae, um, and this is where the head uh, would have been. Extensive charcoal around the legs of this individual, uh, yielding a, a two sigma calibrated radiocarbon date of 687 to 959, with, so a midpoint of 823, so terminal classic. Um, and, and some other associated secondary burials placed in with this person. So we know from all of this charcoal that there was some sort of smoke, smoking burning event um, uh, that Urchkak that went on um, with the interment of this person. There was a kind of a ledge over here, and I know this is, uh, you, you probably can't see this with too much detail. But there was a carved cranium that was uh, shattered uh, when we encountered it. Um, but the pieces came together um, in a way that we could uh, see how the cranium had been carved. And there was a cock glyph or smoke glyph um, right in the forehead area here. And then the cranial vault had been carved with the pattern of a pope uh, mat motif up here, symbol of authority. Um, the mandibles were carved with cartouches of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, these, some of these letters have wrapped around, um, avian and, um, and canine uh, imagery within these cartouches, which is evocative of some of the warrior sodalities, which then become very prominent in the uh, post-classic. Um, and this seems surely to be emblematic of some kind of position of authority. Um, there is a, uh, 
Bill Ringel talks about the title Yahalkak as a secondary lore title from the post classic. And the, the vessel forms you can see cha have changed dramatically now. We're no longer uh, using uh, the spouted vessels uh, the and the cylindrical vessels of the late classic period, the pictorial polychromes, nowhere in evidence. And we have this new piriform up on a pedestal that um, Bill Ringel and, <clears throat> and George Bay have suggested was the cacao drinking vessel of choice for the sort of terminal classic, early post classic, this period that is uh, still rather poorly understood. Um, so here we see the uh, sort of the, the way in which the, the icono way in which iconography and uh, hieroglyphic knowledge of royal burial practices feeds back into an understanding of this burial of a um, possibly a secondary lord or a local headman of some kind. The, um, <clears throat> so the, this is just a little window into the tremendous variation and complexity uh, that one can see in burial interments. Um, and so that ancestors were not treated in any uh, a one way, any simple way, um, regardless of what class or status there were. It's a tremendous amount of, of, of complexity in dealing with the dead um, and concepts of afterlife. Okay, so why, why keep all, what all these examples had in, had in common is uh, that ancestors were being kept pro uh, proximate to the living. Um, and this is a question that <clears throat> my students all, often ask me, like, why did they keep the dead so close to them? Um, uh, why didn't they kind of get them, get them off into a cemetery somewhere? Um, and so this is a very different kind of way of thinking about um, uh, thinking about the dead and um, their, your relationship uh, to the dead. And that's why I like this um, scene out of the Codex with the um, wrapped, seated uh, uh, kind of mummy bundles, but not mummies uh, in a technical sense, that are just seated there and amidst other activities that are going on. Um, and, and in 95, I really stressed um, how ancestors were linked to land rights and identity. And, and I still think that that um, is part of the equation. But, uh, but I also think now that <clears throat> ancestors really did become part of the inalienable possessions um, and the wealth of a house or a kingdom. Um, and so they were these precious, valuable uh, entities, the actual physicality of the dead, um, and you um, kept them close by. Um, and Julia Hendon really stresses this in her book on households, in, in which she characterizes houses as these sort of storehouses of, uh, of the dead. Um, and, um, and, and the dead is being these very, perceived as these very valuable uh, things that uh, one wanted to keep in one's um, one air area to sort of not let them get too far away from you. Um, the, uh, Susan Gillespie has suggested that a actually the, the reason the dead were kept so close was to safeguard potentially uh, revitalizable souls of the dead that the body, of course, was, uh, uh, <clears throat> was on an irrevocable course towards decomposition, um, but that a soul could be, uh, could be uh, kind of revitalized and reconstituted um, in, um, in a, in perhaps in a descendant. And this is a variant on the, that, the Zutu Hill notion, that a concept that I, that I mentioned earlier, and, and we'll come back to this again. And then finally, uh, keeping ancestors close to remember, to recall, uh, and to affect concurrence. So the notion that, and, and this is what Fitzsimmons, Houston, and others have emphasized this in reference to royal ancestors, but clearly uh, there was some component of this that was salient uh, also for the other 99%. Um, Okay, so I think, and, and also this notion is not completely uh, uh, irrelevant to uh, Maya people today. Um, last summer, I'm doing, uh, starting up a project in Yucatan on the colonial period, so we were visiting colonial churches. Um, this is one at Nabalam in Yucatan, 
um, the outside of the church, and this is a corner of back corner of the church with this wonderful green uh, cross. Um, and we kept noticing that there were these plaques um, on the side walls of the church. Here's a close-up view of one of them. Um, and we were not really understanding what they were because the Mexican government, uh, after this cholera outbreak, after cholera outbreak in the 19th century, had disallowed and made illegal any kind of interment within a church or within uh, the, under the floor of the church, the courtyards around the church, illegal, verboten, cannot do. And so, um, but then we realized that these these plaques were actually patches and that there had been this big hole that had been excavated into the wall of the church. And um, the um, <clears throat> And Ivan uh, Batun Alcuche, who's, who's Yucatec Maya, my, my co-director on this project, is explained that the, uh, these, would, these were secondary burials. Um, individuals would be uh, buried someplace else and then exhumed, um, and uh, their bones would be placed inside the church wall and then a plaque um, placed over it. Uh, discounts at tu alma, rest your soul. So the notion of safeguarding souls, I think, is uh, uh, still an option. Concept. Okay, if we push it way back to the late classic um, and think about remembering, recalling, and affecting concurrence, um, one of our, our uh, sort of more, most famous uh, tablets, Piedras Negras Panel 3 here, uh, talks about celebrating an ancestral ruler with a nighttime, with nighttime cacao drinking uh, and a descending macaw dance. And Steve Houston has written in some detail about dance and how dance had um, was very powerful, very efficacious in affecting a concurrence, in bringing uh, the spirit, the soul of an ancestor or the spirit of a deity uh, back and sometimes back to actually inhabit the body of the dancer um, and to affect this concurrence, um, to kind of fold back time and bring someone, uh, the soul, the spirit of someone back into the present. Um, and so we, and he's mentioned that uh, for, in his opinion, there are over uh, 50 uh, hieroglyphically um, described events of concurrence that we know of. And so a very salient concept, this concept of folding back, bringing back. Um, and I think another way in which we, we see evidence of this, um, and this is some work uh, from David, again from David Stewart's Order of Days book, um, The Folds of Time in Classic Maya Dynasty. So here is an accession date of uh, Hukpalam, so Quetzal uh, Jaguar in 431. Um, and then another accession date down here, over 300 years later, of Kinitka Balam. Um, and so you have the, uh, the kind of folding back in terms of an individual much, much later on taking the name of a ruler from earlier times. And, and there is a beautiful symmetry of this that we can see happened at Palenque uh, with many rulers, including the famous Kenich Hanab Fakal. Um, so this seems to be um, arguably um, Another example of this process known as Holok Keshok in Zutu Hilmayan, or the transformation or renewal of ancestral form, as Carlson and Prechtel uh, published and talked about it in their 1991 publication. Um, so this folding back of time to, um, uh, so that at these critical juncture points, um, we are, in a sense, revisiting um, the people and places uh, of an earlier time period. Now, I was thinking about this in terms of our chronology, our Maya chronology. And you know, we, um, my, my students are always saying, well, the Maya had a circular uh, concept of time. I'm like, well, not really. Um, I mean, seasonally, they had a calendar of the seasons, as do we, and that's very circular. Um, but then we have a very emphasized linear notion of time, right? When we talk about the uh, march of years, the march of centuries and millennia. Um, and these, this is one of the chronologies you often see. Um, and, and it also is a, 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 a technique that 
evokes this notion that these blocks of time are kind of periods of punctuated stasis. So we have lots and lots of change right in this little area here, and then, oh, okay, now we're in the late pre-classic. We do things one way for several hundreds of years, and then lots and lots of change. And of course, we know that's not really the way things happen, but the construct that we use to think about it certainly promotes that mindset. Um, so the, um, but then here's a, I found this in Wikipedia. I was looking for some sort of concept of time in which time would be spiraling and kind of folding back on itself. And this is the closest that I could come to it, the geological uh, time spiral in Wikipedia. Um, and the notion that you would have these uh, tangents or uh, uh, con of concurrence or fold back along the spiral. And I think this might come closer to uh, the, the, con the way in which time uh, uh, was conceptualized in, um, among, uh, the, in, 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 uh, among classic Maya, and to some extent this might uh, continue today. Now I think a really interesting example of how this does continue today is 2012. So here we have Western popular culture approaching 2012 uh, with apocalyptic dread. Okay, people were actually buying bunkers in Colorado because they thought the world was going to end. Like we were, you know, at the end of this kind of vertical ladder of time. Boom, every ladder has a top to it, right? So then you fall off of it and time is over, end time. Um, and, but then every time we, so we became very vested to, in when we were working on these cultural heritage programs, uh, with groups um, in the Maya region to kind of ask, ask people, Maya people, what do you think of 2012? What does it mean to you? And I thought the greatest quote came from Pablo Mies, who is uh, a Kekchi um, Maya leader in the Toledo district of southern Belize. And he said, mm, 2012, a great opportunity for Maya people. So a very, very different approach to it. But it totally makes sense because if you think about the last 400 years, uh, 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 approximately well, the amount of time in a Bakhtun. The last 400 years have been probably the worst period of time Mayan people have ever experienced because that's the colonial period, colonialism, and then the rise of nation states, which were in some ways worse than colonialism um, for Mayan people. So it's a, um, so for, from the, from the perspective, even though it's this old dynastic calendar that really very few Maya, that Maya people don't really keep anymore, but nonetheless it does represent a kind of a point at which uh, time folds back on itself, a new Bakhtun uh, begins, and there's an opportunity for renewal, and new things can happen. So for instance, um, uh, with the Akaldes Association in southern Belize, they took the opportunity to uh, throw away their old scrolls of office, which had uh, like a picture of Queen Elizabeth on it. I mean, really the embodiment of colonialism. Um, and uh, they instead uh, created new scrolls with uh, Maya sites and, and Maya people and things like that on them. And so uh, a new beginning, a new start, a, an opportunity for, um, uh, for things to be better and things to be different. Okay, and we see this happening in different ways in different places. Certainly Guatemala, after the uh, peace accords of 95, uh, redefined the terms of engagement uh, between Mayan peoples and their ancestral places, their spiritual places um, in Guatemala. Um, and, with, and that manifests itself in the creation of these fire pits. Here's uh, one at Kamenal Huyu, uh, and here's one at Tikal with uh, people praying and making offerings um, in front of the fire pits. Um, and so it's, um, you know, people, there's tourists walking all around these people. So when someone is standing there praying, um, and they're praying in, in, in this incredibly potent, powerful place of their ancestors, they're very well aware of the fact that they're under the touristic gaze. Um, but it's significant to just to be able to be there and to be, um, and to be, uh, and to be making offerings in this place that that is perceived as so so spiritual, spiritually powerful, um, and so we see that um, <clears throat> reengagement taking place um, in a way that I think is very promising for Maya people. 
So we, this problematic of, of, of Maya uh, people today, and, and really just uh, indigenous people in general, and how they uh, relate to their past, uh, particularly if that past is uh, not really under their control any longer because of events of, of the colonial period and, and nation state building. That's a problematic that we as anthropologists, of course, are, are um, deeply involved with and um, here too at the Penn Cultural Heritage Center dealing with these very issues. And so since 2006, originally as Machi and now as Inherit, um, we've been addressing this relationship of contemporary Maya people to deep time, to the places of deep time, to their deep time ancestors, um, building partnerships with communities in the Maya region and conducting uh, multi-sided heritage programs uh, all over the place, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras. And a lot of this stuff is very kind of out of the box kind of stuff so that I'm wondering what I'm doing writing scripts for a puppet mentory on Maya cultural heritage. Here's a little puppets here. Um, a lot of, we've done a lot of radio uh, shows that feature uh, radio novellas that have sort of juicy plot lines, but then they also address issues of cultural heritage. A lot of uh, school enrichment programs for kids, um, community mapping programs in Highland Guatemala. So just trying to get some dialogue going about these deep histories that have been created by archaeologists, which many um, in uh, many my people today feel are kind of alien to them. They don't really feel a connection to them. And so, uh, and I think that feeling a connection to them is, is, a, is a very important thing. So I characterize this as a, as a post postmodern archaeology um, uh, or uh, moving towards uh, a thing I call heritage without irony. And that is without the irony of saying, wow, look, such a valorized past. Oh, people with such a stigmatized present. Um, so trying to move beyond that, engendering really transcultural dialogue, because thinking of archaeologists and archaeology, what we do as a, as a culture, as a culture of science, um, and so affecting a dialogue at this busy intersection of indigeneity, archaeological practice, nation states, and the heritage uh, tourism industry. And so it's a, it's a, there's a lot happening there. It's all coming together, a lot of interests, a lot of powerful political and financial interests that are all uh, coming together at, at this busy intersection. And the, probably the Grand Central Station of that busy intersection, or one of them, there's arguably more than one, um, would be Chichen Itza. Huh? Um, particularly El Castillo, which means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and it it's, has been voted one of the wonders of the world, um, so it is completely cordoned off, and one can no longer climb on top of it. Um, and it's thought to have been built in the 8th to 9th century. So how is this ancestral place perceived by Yucatec Maya people today? Um, there are actually quite a bit has been written about this. People, uh, authors like Quetzil, uh, Castaneda, Lisa Breglia have talked about the kind of ownership that people feel who are vendors, who uh, sell their wares, increasingly thousands of them inside of Chichen. Um, the uh, custodios, the people who make a living caring for the site and um, touring people around the site. But they're also, uh, the site is, um, the site itself controlled by Ina, the ground the site is built on, now owned by the state of Yucatan. So everybody has a, a little piece of Chichen, but there are also many factors of alienation that have distanced um, descendants um, uh, from this place. And just to give you uh, an interesting uh, example of one of these, um, I want to tell you about um, uh, Scott Hudson of the University of Kentucky, who uh, received a small grant from, it, from us, from Inherit, to uh, enhance bidirectional knowledge exchange uh, with the communities of Uki and Kankabal, that he, he's working on sites near both of those two communities. This is it's kind of on the outskirts of Motul. So um, Scott was working with some uh, youth 
from the communities. And then this is a shot where the, the uh, final presentation is being given to the community at the end of their field work. And rather than Scott give it, the young um, guys who had been working with them in the field gave it. And then at the last minute, they decided rather than giving it in Spanish, they'd give it in Yucatec so that their grandmothers could understand what they had done. Um, so that was all very good stuff. And then um, we gave Scott enough money to rent a school bus, uh, two school buses, uh, but kind of dilapidated, I guess, because he said they broke down on the way back. And they, he took as many members of the community who wanted to visit uh, Chichen to Chichen on a Sunday um, when admittance is free for, uh, for Mexican people. So the, um, and even though this is only about 60 kilometers away from Chichen, um, hardly anyone in the community had ever visited Chichen. Um, and so they got in the bus and they went to Chichen and then um, they, um, they got up to the temple um, to the Castillo and uh, they looked at the cordoned off area and they realized they couldn't even climb up the temple and they uh, became very unhappy and dismayed and they didn't understand why they couldn't climb up the stairs of the temple since that temple had been built by their ancestors. Um, and so we see that these forces of alienation um, can be reversed uh, rather uh, easily with uh, sort of time and opportunity and resources, the opportunity for engagement with the past. Um, suddenly, these, uh, this deep past does not seem so alien and, or so foreign. Um, but we have a lot of work left to do um, in this area. This is uh, Ivan Batun right here. And he teaches at a new university called Uno Universidad Oriente. It's in Valladolid. It's only, it's less than 10 years old. It's established to give Yucatec Maya kids a chance to get a college education without having to, the expense of, an, of, of living in Merida, which many can't afford. And so he teaches archaeology, Maya archaeology, to these students. Um, and some of them, just tell him at the end, you know, well, I just don't know what to make of this archaeology because it's really different from uh, lo que cuentan los abuelos. It's really different from the stories my grandmothers tell me, my grandparents tell. And some of them don't, don't believe the, the archaeological material that, that he pre is presenting. So you can see it's a very alien thought process. Um, and that it, uh, it, this is an area that it, it needs some work um, because uh, it, it, to, in order for these students to affect some sort of, in their mind, some way of reconciling archaeological knowledge of the past with stories that uh, their grandparents tell them. Um, so in, <clears throat> but the, the attention to the past is, uh, uh, and this notion that, that we are, time kind of folds back on itself and there are auspicious moments of opportunity uh, when one can, uh, or conjunctures, when one can kind of move an agenda forward. Um, we see that also in um, some of the work that we're doing in Guatemala in conjunction with La Fundacion Rican. Um, they've built these wonderful community libraries all over the highlands of Guatemala and a lot in Honduras also. Um, and, as, and, and in the mom-speaking area in the community of Witan, um, this is the community of Witan here, and there's a hill or pyramid in, um, in the back here with a cross with this wonderful bi um, color symbolism on it, um, copal burning constantly, and it is uh, believed to be the burial place of the last mom ruler who was killed by Spaniards. Um, and that would have happened, you know, over 400 years ago. So the, uh, but it's still a place that is an active site of ancestor veneration. Um, and the community is now having come through a, a particularly uh, horrible, horrendous time during the Civil War within Guatemala, um, is now uh, looking outward and thinking about plans to develop a tourism uh, plan to invite people to come um, and see uh, see this place, um, this ancestral place, and share it with people around them. And then, I guess finally, the um, 
some of the uh, work that we've been doing in, uh, with uh, Chorti students in and around the, uh, the aldea, the aldeas around Copan Ruinas. Um, and uh, Ricardo Agurcia, who is here with us today, has generously agreed to kind of take on this program through the Children's uh, Museum in Copan Ruinas. And um, so these kids are re-engaging here with the technologies and literary traditions of their ancestors. And so the boys have made codices here. Um, and um, they're pretty basic codices, but uh, they'll get more complex uh, as time goes on. Um, and so they're affecting uh, a, a re-engagement uh, with the technologies of old here. So I think that in conclusion, we can say that um, it's entirely possible that the future may fall back on itself as Mayan peoples re-engage uh, with uh, their deep time ancestors and begin to create narratives of the past that will be very interesting because I believe that they will be, in, be informed by both these folded time systematics um, and archaeological methods. Uh, we will figure out uh, a rapprochement uh, between these two approaches. So for me, it's a theoretically a very exciting time. Thank you. <laughs>